So we'll begin reading here in 1 John chapter 2 at verse uh, 9. I'll read verses 9 through 11, and uh, we'll get into our study. 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. John writes, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness. And does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, John has been writing to these uh, his recipients of this letter, and he he's told them that uh, that we've been given a new commandment. We saw that in verse eight of chapter two. He had said again a new commandment when he had spoken of this new commandment. I mentioned to you that the word "new" there in the original language speaks of that which is fresh, a fresh commandment. And this new or fresh commandment is new in the sense that it's new in revelation. You see, the love of Jesus had been something the world had never seen before. The love that moved him to embrace the cross was actually during his day as it would be today. It was unheard of. The thought that God would send his son to do what he did was beyond belief. So that kind of love was a thing that was true in him. And this is the love shown by Christ and experienced by his apostles as well as those who have a relationship with him. He had said in verse 8 that the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The love that the world shows has been exposed, in other words. It's been exposed for what it is. The love that is of the world is really darkness. He said we love in this fashion because we no longer walk in darkness. We're children of light. And the way we became children of light, as we saw, is because we've been born again. It's a a word that is used to describe being born again, regeneration. We've been regenerated. In John 12, 46, Jesus said, I've come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. So we no longer walk in darkness. And that's why in verse 9, when John said, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness. So what he was doing there and what he is doing is he's contrasting the true believer, a true follower of Christ, with someone who is a false professor, somebody who says, I know him, but in reality doesn't. It's interesting how he uses this, this phrase, he who says. He had used that already in verses, verse 6, verse 8, verse 10, chapter 2, verse 4, and chapter 2, verse 6. That would have been chapter 1, verse 6, 8, and 10. And that is a a way that somebody who's making a false profession of faith would speak. So he who says is speaking really of someone who's just saying but not doing. So these are the words that false Christians would use. They have a false profession of faith in the Lord. Because a genuine Christian, and this is a key and a very important point to make that John is making in his letter, a, a genuine Christian loves other believers, loves other believers around the world. There is not to be any hatred for other Christians. This kind of emotion reveals a hardened, even a selfish heart. And it can even be evidence that the person who harbors hatred for somebody who knows the Lord is an evidence that person isn't saved. The one who says that he loves God ought to love his brother also. And that's just a fact. So genuine conversion, a genuine regeneration is always revealed by the love of God and is always revealed by a walk in the light. Now, does that make it easy? Is it easy to love somebody who's harmed you? Is that easy? Of course not. I wouldn't pretend that it is because it isn't. It's something you die to. It's something that you ask God to give you the ability to do, to love those who who have spitefully used you to love those who have harmed you, to love those, to have a love of God in in you for somebody who who is far away from God. But not only that, but to love those who also love Jesus Christ. You know, there's an awful lot of antagonism in the body of Christ. There's a lot of anger in the body of Christ. I see it quite often. And the Lord would have us to know that, no, if I love, then if I love him, then I have to love my brother also. And that's what John is talking about. That's what John is saying here. He says, and notice in verse uh, 10 and 11, he, he said that the one who loves his brother abides in the light. So genuine conversion is going to produce what we would call a walk in the light. 
But those who don't love their fellow believers, he is saying, are walking in darkness. Proverbs 4.19 says it like this. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They don't know what makes them stumble. And so a believer in Christ is not one who hates a brother, not one who walks in darkness, not one who's been blinded uh, by the darkness, but has been enlightened by the Lord. We're to love one another. So he goes on and he says this in verse 12. I, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you've known the father. I've written to you, fathers, because you've known him who's from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you're strong. The word of God abides in you. You have overcome the wicked one. John has been writing concerning those who walk in darkness. So to encourage his readers, he's assuring them of what he thinks of them. And these verses give us a picture of the makeup of the body of Christ. It gives us insight into the development of Christian maturity as well. And I want you to notice this because I'm going to develop this for a few minutes with you. Notice how John speaks of little children, young men, and fathers. Every church is made up of, of children, of young men, and fathers. This would be speaking of uh, children in the faith. It, it's not necessarily chronological, but it's speaking of maturity and advancement in maturity in the Lord. It, it speaks of both males, obviously, and female. And he's beginning to write here. Notice how he begins. He writes to little children. Now, in the New Testament, calling, calling them my little children is actually a term of endearment. It was used by dis teachers who were speaking to their disciples. So in these verses, John is speaking to the members who are young in faith. Now, they're spiritual children, and so he's giving them some encouragement, truth that gives them peace. First, you see it in verse 12. He says, your sins are forgiven them for his sake. Their sins are forgiven them for his sake. And then in uh, verse 13, he says that they have known the Father. So here's something that is very practical, the foundation of spiritual growth. And I shared this with you when we were in Ephesians. We saw it, I think, fairly clearly in the, in the writing of Paul to the Ephesian church. But the foundation of the Christian life, the foundation of spiritual growth is very simple. It's understanding that you've been forgiven. It's understanding and receiving that you have been completely forgiven because you trusted Jesus Christ. This is the foundation of our Christian life, knowing that God has forgiven you. The sins that once separated us from him have been completely forgiven. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. That understanding changes our life. That understanding is the foundation of a spiritual life. Now, he's been writing concerning the error that had crept in, a denial of a sin nature, a denial of acts of sin. He already saw, said that in chapter 1, verse 8, in verse 10. So he's reinforcing this basic truth. As newly converted believers, you have little experience in your walk. You're learning the way of your father, and you're learning of his love for you. And this is important. And therefore, like Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, he said, My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, there is a fellow, some of you may be familiar with his name, Carl Menninger. The Menninger Clinics. He was a psychiatrist. And Carl Menninger once said that if he could convince the patients in psychiatric hospitals that their sins were forgiven, 75% of them could walk out the next day. Do you see how important that is? Even a secular man can say, these people are wrestling with guilt. These people are wrestling with a burden that they can't relieve themselves of. Of. 
They need to know. You need to know. We need to know that we have been 100% forgiven. Not just 50% or 60%, 80% or even 90%. But it's amazing to me, and it took a while for me as a new believer, and that's why I'd be referred to as a little child. It took a long time for me really to come to grips with the fact that God really had forgiven me because my sin was ever before me, because I had, I had memories of sinfulness, things I had hurt people by doing, pain that I had caused other people, and, and, and a sense of guilt for doing those things, for hurting my parents, for hurting my family, for hurting friends. And when I was given the opportunity, by the way, when I got saved, I asked for forgiveness. I asked for forgiveness from my parents. I asked for forgiveness from those whom I'd hurt. I, I didn't just say, oh, now I'm forgiven and move on. I, I knew that I had some responsibility to approach people, and let them know I know what I've been, and I want you to know I'm sorry for that. Forgive me for that. And I did. And I asked my dad, Dad, would please forgive me for the son I've been. And that's something I have to tell you that can stay in the back of your mind, that, that there are things that you've done that even though you know God has forgiven you, it can still rattle around and, and it, it can still sometimes pop up in the most interesting ways. But, you know, I asked my, 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 my father, my dad, I said, Dad, forgive me for the son that I, that I have been. Mama, forgive me for the, for the, the, the crazy son that, that I've been. And I asked my sisters and all, why? Because it wasn't just that I was receiving forgiveness from God. That was enough. But I also knew that I need to reconcile with those I've hurt. So I did that. And that's how I started my journey towards healing. So as a new believer, I needed to know one thing. I have been forgiven by God. Now he goes on and he says in verse 13 as well as verse 14, he says, I write to you fathers because you have known him. You have known him who is from the beginning. I, I'm writing to you, fathers. Fathers have continued in the faith. They've never left their first love. They have left behind a legacy of spiritual children who follow their example. And fathers are the ones who have gained a deep knowledge of God through trials and experience. And that has given them a certainty. That has given them a stability in Jesus Christ. It reminds me of Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27 where Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. After my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. I know that my Redeemer lives. That's the, that's the word that a father would say. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. That my Redeemer lives. That's what a father will say. A father has a knowledge of God and has walked with the Lord for many, many years. And then he speaks concerning the young men. He says in verses 13 and 14, I write to you, young men, you've overcome the wicked one. When he says you've overcome the wicked one, he's speaking of, of the devil, obviously. He's saying young men have mastered, have overcome the wicked one, and they are strong in faith. They've gone through spiritual battles, and they have prevailed through Christ. Young men have endured temptations. They've demonstrated spiritual strength. They have resisted the influence of the air that is seeping into the church. They resist by standing in the word of God. They, they walk in the light, and their joy is abounding. They, they're keeping, his, guarding his word. They're abiding in him. They're loving the brethren, and that's because the word of God is abiding in them. In John 14, 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. These young warriors have strength. They've endured. They have victory in Christ. Their character is being formed. Their faith is developed. Because the word abides in them, they overcome. They conquer the wicked one. That word wicked there is a Greek word, paneros. It means the malicious one. God's word is in them, and they practice it. They obey it. And because of that, they are victorious. They're warriors. In Daniel 11:32, the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Psalm 37, 31, the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Now, every one of us in this room is in one of those stages. 
for the longest time when I first got saved until not that long ago. Well, when I was first saved and I was reading my Bible and I said, little children, I said, well, it's got to be talking to me, and it is. I'm young in my faith and I'm beginning to develop it. But at a certain point, I began to identify myself with not just the little children because I had spent time in the Word. I was learning the Word of God, going to Bible college, teaching Bible studies, and putting it into practice. And, and I found myself identifying with the young men. And it was just recently, and I don't know how this is going to come out, um, that God said, you're not a young man anymore. <laughs> you're a father. What is the father? You're an elder. You're an aged man. You've grown old in the Lord. It's like King David at one time, it was time for war, it was time for battle. And King David started to suit up to go to war. And his men said, no. You're more valuable to us than thousands of warriors. You stay behind, David. It's time for us to go forward and fight. Well, that touches my heart. Because I know that I have entered into that area. And I like it. I'm glad to be there. I tear up. Because I'd like to put the uniform on. But the Lord said, you've got experience that you should be giving to others so that they might do the warfare that you no longer are called to do. Every one of us in this room is at one of those stages. Little children, new believers perhaps, or those who have yet to develop their faith. You might have been walking with God or knowing him since 10 years ago, but you haven't grown well, you're still looked at now as a little child. That doesn't mean you have to stay there. It simply means that's where you're at right now, little children. Then you have the young men who want to do exploits, who want to go out and do something for God. I want to get, I used to say, I want to get my uniform dirty. When I, when I played ball, I, I played a lot of sports for a long time when I used to be able to when I was a young man. I wasn't the guy who sat on the bench chewing the edge of my glove, wishing. I was the guy who went into the game, and I wanted to dirty that uniform. I wanted to play hard, and I did. I played hard. When Marie and I were going out, as it just when she and I were, were dating, I played on three softball teams a week. I played a lot of sports. I played a lot of sports for a long time. That's what I did. At a certain point, I realized those days are or over, hang up the cleats, it's time to do something else. But I've always had that aggressive kind of competitive, let's go out and let's get our uniforms sturdy. Let's go out and do something. Let's do it. I brought that mentality into ministry. I don't want to sit on the Lord's bench. I want to be in the game. I want to be out there swinging swords. I want to be in there combating. Because life is, is filled with opportunity to do something for God. That blesses others, right? And so the, I have men and, and women in this room that would be called, you know, the young warriors. He's referring to them as young men, but it refers to us. He has, the, we have those in our church, those who want to do something for God. And you have the children, you have the warriors, and you have the elderly. Elderly, not frail. Elderly, meaning we have walked with God. I've walked with the Lord next month, 52 years. It's a long time to be walking with Jesus. And he's taught me a lot of things over 52 years of walking with him. And these are the things that I want to give to you. These are the things that I want to share to our fellowship. This is what God can do if you trust him. This is what God can do if you hold fast to him. God can move through you. Why can't he? I used to tell that to people all the time. I'd say, why can't he use you? What is it about your life that keeps him from using you? Why can't he use you? Why not? Look at this world. Look where it's going. Look what's happening. The church has to stand up and speak. You should do that. Why not? When I was a young warrior, 
and I'd be in college, in secular college. I didn't go to just Christian college. I went to secular college. And I would open my mouth in the class when nobody else would. And I would say, this is what the Lord says. I still remember people who would mock me. I still remember the, the response that some had. But you know what? I didn't care. Because somebody had to say something in the name of Jesus Christ. And if, if people weren't going to do it, I said to the Lord this. And I still remember saying it. Father, if no one speaks for you, I will. And that was my attitude then. Long before I was called Pastor David. I was a believer in Jesus Christ who wanted people to know him. I was in a class that... In, uh, when I was in college, I was in a class. It was a California history class. And the professor said, every one of you have an assignment. You're going to have to stand before the class. I'm going to give you a word. And I want you to just extemporaneously use that word and give to us, give to us some thoughts concerning the word I give to you. And so I'm just seated there in this class. And I still remember this very well. And I, it was like, a few weeks into the class, lots of students had already gotten up. And he said, uh, David, it's your turn. And I'm, you know, 20, 24 years old, and I stand up, and I go to the front of the class just like this. And I look at all these bored people just like this, and I said, <laughs> and I stood there. And the professor said, your word is freedom. And so I said, Freedom. And I gave a message. I said, when you say freedom, I have one who has given me that. His name is Jesus Christ. He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And every person in this room who doesn't know Jesus Christ is a slave. But Jesus Christ has set you free because that's what Christ came to do. And I shared the gospel with him. And I sat down, and a woman sitting next to me, a young woman sitting next to me, said out loud, he doesn't say much, but when he does speak, he says something important to hear. I was willing to do that. And I was only a couple of years old in Christ. I was not Pastor David. I'd been a Christian a little over three years, three and a half years. But these kids needed to know Jesus Christ. That professor needed to know Jesus Christ. As that Cal Poly, I had a homosexual professor who was teaching marriage and the family. And so my, the, he, want, he had us do a, a paper, and, I, and the paper, you, you can choose what you want. So I, I wrote a paper on the husband being the priest of the home. And I gave a Bible study to him in paper form out of Ephesians 5, homosexual teacher. And after the class, he approached me. He and I walked to the car as he was talking to me, and he said to me, I have never heard anything like that before. So walking through that parking lot with this man, real nice guy and everything, you know, but walking with him and talking to him, shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. That's what you do. See, that's what young men do. That's what warriors do. And at a certain point, you become the elder because you, you have had your battles. You've had your scars. You've had your, your victories You've had your defeats, the times that you wish you wouldn't have said that. I could have said it better. You've learned from those things. But there's one thing you haven't done, and that is you haven't departed from the truth. And that's how I've been for 51, almost 52 years. I've had my ups and I've had my downs, and the downs have been bad. But the ups are wonderful. And at this point now, I've come to realize that, no, I'm not the little child, and I'm certainly not the young man. I've become the father. And yesterday in our, I meet with pastors. That's one of the responsibilities I have as a, as a pastor here. I meet with pastors in a region that I, that I oversee. And I had a group of pastors who came yesterday. And one of the pastors, as we were in the class, one of the pastors said to me, he said, he said, Pastor David, I'm 60 years old, but I look at you as you're my father. And uh, one of my friends who, you know, says, you know, how old are you? You're 60, and you look at him, and he said, Dave, you're just an old, old man. And, and I looked at my friend who's older than me, and I said, you're almost dead, shut up, you know. But, <laughs> but I said, you know, and, and forgive me for a moment, this is going to seem, I, I don't know if everybody will understand this, and I don't intend to exclude anybody by the illustration or insight. I, I want to be careful with this, but it's true. And maybe you need to know this. I don't know. My friend who teased me about an, old, an older man calling me father, my friend uh, is not a Hispanic man. But the man who spoke to me is. 
And so I turned to my friend, another pastor, and I said to him, one of the things you don't realize or understand that in the Hispanic community, when a man calls you his father, that is the highest compliment you can have. That is an honor that I receive because that's what we're like in the community I was raised in. So for a man to say you're a father to me, that's one of the highest compliments. And I turned to the man who's 60 years old, and I said, I want to tell you how deeply I appreciate what you just said, and I love you for it. Thank you so much. I hope that I can live up to your, your thoughts of who I am. That is what it's all about, to be a father, to be the mother of the faith, to grow and to be looked at by those who may not be that much younger than you, but respect you for what God has done in you. That's something that I tried to share with my sons, to be a man, to be a man that they can look at. My, women, my, young, young, my daughters be a woman that women can respect because respect means everything, especially in the body of Christ. So live in such a way that people will respect you. Live for Jesus Christ. And so John is speaking to them in that way. I speak to you little children. I speak to you, you young men, you fathers. And he's saying, these are the things that I see in you. And therefore, just hold fast to him. Moving on. Do not love the world, verse 15, or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, when he says, do not love the world, let me give you brief, some brief thoughts. The word world is used in various ways in the Bible. World can speak of the created or the natural world. We see that in John 1, 9, and 10. It says, this was the true light, which lights every man who comes into the world. He was in the world. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. It speaks of the natural world. The world is another way of speaking also of the sinful human race, the race that Jesus came to redeem. God so loved the world, so it can be used in that way. It is also used of what has been referred to as the death system that opposes God and is led by Satan. In John 14, verse 30, Jesus said, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. So John is concerned that the believers would abandon Jesus and desire the world. And that's why he says, do not love this world system. Now, when you look at the, the language, it is literally saying, stop giving the world that which belongs only to God, which is your love. Stop loving the world is what he is saying. And that's a common concern that runs through the history of the church. Somebody once said, I believe that one reason why the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. And that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. The world has influenced the church, but the church is supposed to be influencing the world for Jesus Christ. What is in the world? Well, lust and pride. He says, first, he speaks of the lust of the flesh. When he says the lust of the flesh, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the flesh speaks of inward desires. It's the appeal to the body appetites. It's the temptation to gratify and satisfy our bodily desire. When you have this great desire to satisfy what you consider to be needs that you have, it can be exposed in some ways that are very obvious, like alcoholism or gluttony or the use of drugs or venereal diseases, of pregnancies out of wedlock as diseases like AIDS. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, the Bible says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. We're living in a time when people need to reread this passage. Do not be deceived, because many are. So what is in the world? Well, the desire 
to satisfy your bodily needs. He also speaks of the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes, that's the desire after luxury of every kind. It lends itself to the spending sprees or irresponsible spending for things you really don't need. I used to use the term credit card mania. I knew a lady, I knew a lady at one time many years ago now, a young lady, who every year would use her credit card, every year would use her credit card. She would get rid of all the furniture in her, in her front room in different areas, all of it, in every year, and then she'd buy new furniture. One year, then she'd buy new furniture. Credit card mania, irresponsibly spending, lusting for things with your eyes. In Psalm 119, verses 36 and 37, incline my heart to your testimonies, not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from look, looking at worthless things. Revive me in your way. In Colossians 3, 1 and 2, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Lust of the eyes, a desire after these things. Third, pride of life. My reputation, my achievements, my status, my titles. Uh, one commentator said that pride of life speaks of boasting of ancestry, boasting of connections or great offices, of name dropping. <laughs> name dropping is always trippy to me. Yeah, I was talking to so-and-so just the other day. Sometimes I don't know who the so-and-so is that they're talking about, so I just will smile. Right? Really, that's nice. Who is that? In Luke twenty-two twenty-six, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. He who governs as he who serves. You see, he's saying that the fashion, form, and scheme of this world is doomed. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul said it like this, verses 29 through 31. He said, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. That's pretty good. No, anyway. <laughs> those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. Why is that, Paul? For this world in its present form is passing away. Don't use the system as your model for life. Don't think that because, and this is, this is I believe that if you, I should say it this way, I'll begin this way. I, I really do believe this is a proper way to think. You know, that you've been given whatever you've been given and thank God for it. If you have a, a great house, bless the Lord for it, of course. You have a nice car, wonderful. I think that's great. Just make sure that it doesn't take your heart. Make sure that you use it and it doesn't use you. Because that's where the trap is. You know, if you work hard and, and the reward of your labor is, is material, blessing, well, praise the Lord. Put God first in your giving and, and enjoy what he gives you. You know, I guess that the, the, the greatest thing that I have learned and am learning is contentment. I'm just content. I, 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 I am thankful for a mom and a dad who are not materialistically inclined. I thank God for that. I thank God that my dad put his family where the family should have been, loved his wife to his very last breath, cared for his children the way he did. So I'm thankful for that. My dad wasn't a, a materialist at all. My dad was a man who was not taken by money, but he would use it. And I think that's good advice to give even now. Be careful. You can be taken by the money. You can, you, you can think that if, if I get this particular thing, and it's true, we all know this, especially when you're young, but it, it, it doesn't necessarily grow away. You go away. You don't necessarily outgrow it. It's, it's something that has to be turned from. But when you're young, you say, oh, if I only had this car or if I only had this relationship or only lived in this neighborhood or if I only had this degree, if I only had this kind of uh, relationship with a girl or whatever, um, and then those things become yours and then you realize that they perish with the using. It, it doesn't matter. You've been saving up your money to get that car and you finally got it and that's wonderful. You enjoy it. That's great too. And then you drive to the supermarket to get 
something and you come out and somebody had let their shopping cart run off and it smashed into the side of your car and your joy goes out the window, right? That's a fact. That's just true. You know, before you know it, you're parking, you know, taking up three spaces. So we just have to be careful. Don't let the system um, model your life for you. Be content in the things the Lord gives to you. Let's see now. I think I can take you a little bit further. I don't know. Let's see, shall we? Verse 18, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. And so he says it's the last hour. The last hour is another way of speaking of the last days. It's the time between the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. These last days actually began at Pentecost. You see that in Peter's Pentecost message, Acts 2, 14 through 17. Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, addressed the, the crowd Fellow Jews and all you who, who live in uh, Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Now, Pentecost had happened, and so the people were being mocked as being drunk. So he said, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In the last days, God says. And so that's when it began. Hebrews 1, 2 says it like this. God has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So the last period in human history began with Jesus, and we are now in the final stage. John is saying that in the last days, many antichrists will arise. This all will lead to the revelation of final, the final world ruler, the antichrist. He's the coming world ruler. He's empowered by Satan. He attempts to replace Jesus. And we're going to be looking at that as we go through 1 John, and I'm going to develop that further. But he's speaking of people who went out. He says, now notice in verse 19, he says it like this. They went out from us, but they were not of us. These are people who went out from us. They separated themselves from genuine believers is what he's saying. They departed first from God and then from the church. They departed, he's saying, from the congregation of believers. These are people who had been participants in the church but never were saved. They were like Judas. They were like Demas. They were deniers, betrayers. They were traitors to Christ. And that, by the way, is something that is part of church life to this day. Paul in 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen 19 said it like this. He said, there must also be factions. The word faction speaks of a party or a party division or disunion. There must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. These people have departed, but the fact that they departed, John is saying, reveals them that they were never saved. If they'd been of us, they, he, he says, they would have continued with us. If they were of us, they would have accepted the doctrine of the apostles. You see, evidence of being a believer is abiding in the word of God with other Christians. So those who are genuinely Christian continue in the things of God. Like Jesus said in John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. The false teachers leave the church and they take people with them. Their departure from truth and the church Fellowship unmasks them as deceivers. They were not saved because a genuine believer abides in Christ. So those who depart only had a passing taste of the gospel. You see, when God is moving, deceivers infiltrate. It's inevitable. The enemy begins his attempts to destroy God's work. And sometimes he uses people who come in to destroy by bringing in error with them. We have had that here in this church, especially in earlier days when we were, live, we were on this property and we had our bookstore. There was a particular cultic group that was in Upland. I was aware of it and had shared with some people related to it. And they were teaching that you could be perfect. You could be sinlessly perfect and things like that. 
And so I had warned people, and I said, be aware of this. And what had happened is during that day, at that time, they would come in to buy Bibles here. And they began to proselytize, to try and convert one of the young men. I didn't know about it when it was going on. I had not heard this. Nobody told me. But they began to share with the young man who was working behind the counter in our bookstore many years ago. And I didn't know about that. I knew, of the, I knew of the cult. I knew of the leader of the cult and a variety of things. I knew of that, but I didn't know they were coming on campus here. And they did regularly until one day, too late, the young man who used to work for us quit so he could go off with them and uh, follow the God that they were teaching. And there was nothing we could do to help him with that. You see, these things happen, even have happened here. We have had people who have left their brochures and pamphlets in church pews, our church pews here, to try and draw people away. Part of the reason we have men who are around, stationed around, um, you know, helping you find a place to park, and sometimes people get all upset because how come they're doing that? We have them there for more than one reason. One of the reasons is we had people who were coming onto the church grounds and leaving their pamphlets on the windshields of the cars. They will come on the grounds. They will come into church services. I've had debates with them after church services. They will come in and do that. They will come in and do that. And so deceivers do that. They, whenever the Lord is moving amongst people, the, the enemy tries to infiltrate. It can happen in a variety of ways. It's really big right now uh, uh, through social media. So by ignoring their presence... They're allowed to gain a foothold. So our responsibility is to teach with conviction and be aware of the error. In Romans 16, 17, and 18, Paul said it like this. I beseech you, brethren, mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. Avoid them, for they are such, they are such, who ser- that, the, they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, their own appetites. And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. What does the Antichrist want to do? The Antichrist has Antichrists who come in preparing the way for the acceptance of the final world ruler, the Antichrist. They will undermine the gospel of Jesus Christ. They will present false things that can sound true, especially to a little child, a young person in the faith. It sounds true. They're used in the Bible. They, they say things similar to you. But the bottom line is, is the Christ that they're teaching isn't the same one that's found in Scripture. Some are saying that Jesus Christ is the, is the Savior of the world. But when you ask them, who is Jesus Christ? They'll say, well, he's the brother of Lucifer. Or when you say, who is Jesus Christ? They'll say, well, he's the first creation of God. Or you say, well, who is Jesus Christ? Oh, he is the... Uh, he is the, uh, the, the master, uh, master over the universe. He is a, a great teacher. And when you begin to ask him to define who Jesus Christ is, you discover that it's a different Christ entirely. And so they use language, but they, use, they put into the words definitions that aren't true to the Scripture. As a young believer, I, I spent some time under one of, the, one of America's premier um, apologist. His name was Walter Martin. And uh, I had the chance to sit under his teaching for about a year when I was a new believer. Uh, I, I had that privilege. And so he's the one who actually uh, whet my appetite to be correct in Scripture, to make sure that the words that are being used are filled with the proper meaning. Because one of the things that Walter taught us as students was simple. He said that you have to know what the definition of the word is because they use the same word that you do, but they pack it with a different meaning. So who is Jesus? That's a big question. And when they say, well, he's the first creation of God, or he's a spirit brother of Lucifer, he's married to uh, Mary Magdalene, or, and when they begin to say things like that, then you know these are people who aren't speaking the truth out of Scripture. It's, it's something that we need to know. And so let's see how far I can go right here. Let's see. I got a couple more minutes. So, verse 20. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Again, during that time, the Gnostics were, were entering in and uh, giving a new uh, definition for who Jesus is and the work of God. 
and some of the Gnostics anointed with what they called a special anointing oil. So John is saying that believers have God's anointing. It's his spirit. And so he's saying in verse 21, he says, I haven't written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. No lie, in other words, no matter how well crafted, can ever find its origin in the truth. Who is the liar, verse 22, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is anti-Christ who denies the Father and the Son. So that is what has been called the test of orthodoxy. Who is Jesus Christ? Is Jesus God in the flesh, second person of the Trinity, not a manifestation or revelation of God, but God in the flesh? You see, the Gnostics denied this. They believed that Christ was actually separate from Jesus. There was, a, there was an, the Christ anointing and, and that the, the Christ descended from above and came upon the human Jesus at his baptism. And because the spirit Christ was unable to suffer, the Gnostics taught that, that the Christ departed at his crucifixion. So the denial of Jesus' humanity struck at the very heart of the incarnation. And that's why he says in verse 23, whoever denies the son doesn't have the father either. He who acknowledges the son has the father also. Denying the son does not have the father. To have Jesus is to have God. And to deny this is to deny the truth. And the denial of what scripture teaches is heresy. When you have the son, you have the father. And so we need to understand that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. The Holy Spirit has descended and has filled our hearts. We have become the temple of the Spirit of God. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need some secret initiation through Gnostic understanding, but we receive that anointing when we ask the Lord to baptize us in his Holy Spirit, to fill us with his power. And from that point, we know him because he has sealed us with his spirit and works within us. There was heresy entering the church. We're going to look at this more deeply as we go through 1 John. There was heresy entering in, and John is dealing with that heresy. Why? Because that's what true teachers do, is they deal with the error to set the people who will be taken captive by that error to set them free. That's what true teaching is intended to do. We'll stop here.